Welcome to uh, Hopkins at Home. Uh, my name is uh, Mario Machis, and I'm a professor of economics and management uh, at the Kerry Business School. I also have an affiliation with the Berman Institute of uh, Bioethics. Uh, and um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the economics and ethics of uh, allocating scarce resources uh, during a pandemic. I want to be focusing on the role of prices. And uh, I want to do that because there have been other lectures in the past uh, few weeks uh, at Hopkins that have discussed in depth uh, the ethics of uh, scarce uh, medical resource allocation and, uh, and, and, and planning. So my focus will be on the role of market-based transactions and, uh, and uh, uh, prices. We have a, uh, uh, we will, we're gonna have a, uh, a Q and A session uh, at the end, so feel free to enter your uh, your questions, and uh, I will be very happy to have a conversation um, uh, with you and answer any questions that you might uh, have. So the starting point for uh, for this topic is the observation that um, uh, during emergencies such as natural disasters, uh, uh, snowstorms, uh, or epidemics and pandemics the demand for uh, many goods and services, particularly necessities, goes up uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, we're talking about gasoline uh, in, in, in the aftermath of uh, major hurricanes, for example, but also uh, water, uh, uh, transportation, uh, uh, and uh, food. Uh, um, and in the case of uh, uh, the uh, uh, current uh, uh, COVID-19 epidemic, we have seen uh, the demand for a variety of essential items, uh, including food items, uh, but also uh, uh, respirators, uh, masks, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, disinfectant wipes, uh, uh, toilet paper, uh, and, and a, a variety of other items. Uh, the demand uh, went up a lot. For example, the demand for, uh, for eggs uh, uh, increased by about 100% in the last week of March. That was the uh, um, first week when many US states were introducing uh, uh, lockdowns and people started you know, staying at home and having uh, uh, more frequently uh, every day breakfast, uh, breakfast at home. So the price of uh, uh, eggs uh, together with their, uh, their demand went up. The price of many of these uh, goods uh, uh, goes up again during, during emergencies. And uh, um, typically uh, the uh, public reaction to uh, price increases, uh, particularly when they are perceived as excessive, uh, is uh, uh, very strong and negative, of course. So there's a, uh, often a public outrage about uh, uh, the uh, uh, surge in prices that are often observed uh, in the aftermath or, or during uh, uh, natural emergencies, and in this case, uh, uh, pandemics. So uh, the idea is that uh, customers perceive that uh, the price increases uh, during uh, emergencies uh, um, correspond to uh, exploitation or attempts by sellers to take advantage of a situation of, uh, of, of, of necessity. Um, in, face of this, in the face of this uh, public uh, outrage, uh, public authorities uh, impose and often enforce uh, uh, so-called anti-gouging uh, laws. These are laws that uh, uh, prohibit sellers and distributors from uh, uh, raising the price uh, of essential goods and services uh, uh, too much. Now, in the, in the US, um, uh, there aren't any federal anti-gouging laws, but many states have laws against price, uh, price gouging. Uh, how is price gouging uh, defined? Um, in some states, uh, 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 sellers are prohibited from uh, uh, raising prices by more than a, certain, uh, than a certain percentage. For example, in California, Maryland, and New Jersey, 
uh, sellers may not raise the price by more than uh, uh, 10%. In Pennsylvania, they may not raise the price by more than 20%. When uh, uh, prices go up by more than that, then that could be uh, an indication of, uh, that could be price, uh, price gouging. In other states, for example, in New York, uh, the definition is a bit vague. Uh, for example, again, in New York, producers or distributors of essential goods or services are prohibited from selling for an unconscionably excessive uh, uh, price. What uh, uh, constitutes a, an unconscious, unconscionably excessive price? Uh, well, it's not specified. This is up to the courts, right, to decide whether a price increase was uh, unconscionably excessive. But typically, courts use a, a, as a reference price uh, the price that prevailed prior to the beginning of the emergency or uh, prices of similar goods that consumers can obtain in the same area, at other stores in the same area, or online. Uh, um, uh, I'm gonna be showing some examples uh, uh, later. Um, uh, and, but this is sort of, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, idea uh, and, and the basic sort of motivating, uh, the motivating facts uh, for, today's, uh, uh, for today's talk. Um, Oh, and uh, also, so these uh, laws, like I said, are often uh, uh, enforced uh, and uh, penalties are uh, um, severe. For example, in New York, the Attorney General may seek uh, civil penalties uh, for up to $25,000 uh, uh, in addition to, to you know, restitution to the, uh, uh, for the uh, affected uh, uh, consumers. So we're going to be talking about uh, 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 um, what uh, uh, makes a price uh, uh, fair? When is a price uh, fair or just? Um, this is uh, a uh, question that uh, we, uh, our society, you know, we've been debating for a very long, very long time. So what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm going to be offering my thoughts uh, I'm going to be offering a set of uh, arguments and uh, hopefully those uh, arguments and facts uh, uh, and ideas will be useful. Uh, I'm not going to be, I think, reaching a conclusion. Again, this is a topic that uh, is very hotly debated and has been hotly debated for a long time. I want to take a step back and think about uh, what motivates uh, right, the public's reaction uh, in the face of uh, price increases that are perceived as being excessive and what motivates the public authorities' response uh, to those uh, uh, price uh, increases. And the way I want to do that is by uh, sharing with you um, some ideas uh, from a little-known short essay written by John Locke back in 1695, more than 300 years ago, on precisely on prices and, uh, and morality. Locke's essay starts with this sentence, upon demand, uh, what is the measure that ought to regulate the price for which anyone sells so as to keep it within the bounds of equity and justice? And, 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 and he continues with his essay. But this is the topic, right? What makes a price just? What, uh, when is a price within the bounds uh, of equity and justice? Uh, you can find the essay online and uh, I, I, uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, I'm gonna be, so the way this, the essay is structured is it presents uh, what we, today we would call vignettes, a set of vignettes or, or scenarios where a seller charges a certain price, uh, um, and then he would ask, you know, whether and give his opinion on whether uh, the price uh, in that scenario is, uh, is uh, uh, ethical or, or not. Uh, there's uh, four or five vignettes uh, in the essay. I'm going to be telling you about one of them, which I think is a really nice uh, introduction to, to, to the topic. Um, so let us suppose, this is John Locke, uh, a merchant of Danzig sends two ships laden with corn, whereof the one ship puts into Dunkirk, so one ship takes corn into Dunkirk, where there is almost a famine for want of corn, 
and there he sells the wheat for 20 shillings a bushel, whereas the other ship, the merchant sells at Ostend, somewhere else, just for five shillings per bushel. Then Locke says, here it will be demanded, so we will discuss whether it be not oppression and injustice to make such an advantage of their necessity at Dunkirk uh, as to sell them the same commodities, the same corn, right? At 20 shillings per bushel, which the merchant sells uh, for a quarter the price, only 20 miles uh, uh, away uh, at uh, um, Ostend. So this is the scenario that Locke presents uh, the reader, the reader with, and then he proceeds to analyze it. I'm going to tell you what how Locke analyzes this scenario in 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 a little bit, in a little bit. Before doing that, I want to uh, continue our conversation by thinking about uh, sort of contemporary uh, uh, humans and the way that we perceive uh, prices and price uh, uh, increases. To do that, uh, I uh, will uh, uh, again read some uh, uh, scenarios uh, from a uh, recent, more recent uh, uh, work of uh, uh, psychologists and economists, uh, uh, Kahneman, Knetsch, and Taylor. Uh, professors Kahneman and Professor uh, and, and Taylor, they, they won the Nobel Prize in, in, in economics. Uh, this essay they wrote, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, um, essentially uh, poses a set of uh, scenarios, again, 300 plus years after, uh, after uh, Locke, uh, these three contemporaneous scholars, they pose scenarios to, uh, uh, to people and they ask them to determine whether certain price increases are acceptable or fair or unacceptable or, or unfair. Uh, through discussing these scenarios, I want, I, uh, my goal is for us to sort of develop an intuition for uh, what makes a certain price increase acceptable or, or, or not, according to a representative sample of, uh, of uh, uh, individuals today. So this is the first scenario. A hardware store has been selling snow shovels for $15. The morning after a large snowstorm, the store raises the price to $20. Then uh, respondents to this survey, about 100, were asked to rate the action as acceptable or unfair. 82% uh, of respondents rated this action as not fair. It's not okay for that store to charge $20 for uh, uh, snow shovels that, uh, the day after a snowstorm when they, the day before they were charging only, only $15. Uh, $15. There's a sense in which customers have been exploited or taken advantage of uh, because their demand for snow shovels went up due to the uh, uh, large snowstorm. A second scenario that I want to uh, uh, share uh, with you. Suppose that due to a transportation mishap, um, there is a shortage of letters and that the wholesale price uh, has increased. A local grocer uh, has bought the usual quantity of lettuce uh, at a price that is now 30 cents per head higher than normal. The grocer raises the price of lettuce to customers by 30 cents per head. Uh, so in this case, 79% of respondents said that this is acceptable. So it's okay. Uh, and only 21% said that it's unfair. So for a large majority, it's okay for the seller to protect their own their profits uh, uh, and transfer 100% of the extra costs onto, onto uh, consumers. There's a justification for why the price is higher. And the justification is that uh, uh, it now costs more to the uh, 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 um, the grocery store has to procure uh, the, uh, uh, the product and that makes it okay, acceptable for the seller to raise, to raise the price. Um, the uh, next uh, scenario, uh, there's a few other scenarios that I wanna share with you from this, uh, from this survey. Now here, a uh, landlord owns and rents out a single small house to a tenant who is living on a fixed income. 
A higher rent would mean that the tenant would have to move. Other small rental houses are available. A landlord's costs have increased substantially over the past year, and the landlord raises the rent to cover the cost increases when the tenant's lease is due for renewal. Now, this action is uh, rated as acceptable for 75% of, uh, uh, of, of respondents. So even, this is similar to the previous, previous case. It is acceptable, again, for the landlord in this case to protect herself from losses, even when the buyer, the renter here, suffers a, a substantial uh, inconvenience. They will have to move. But uh, it, because the uh, increase in the price is due to an increase in costs, it is acceptable. That price increase is considered uh, as acceptable. There are more scenarios in this essay. And again, this is a really great essay. Uh, uh, and I, you know, if you're interested, I encourage you to read it. I'm going to discuss two more scenarios uh, from, the, from, the, from the article. Uh, another grocery store has several months of supply of peanut butter in stock, which it has on the shelves and in the storeroom. It's there. The owner hears that the wholesale price of peanut butter has increased and immediately raises the price of the current stock of peanut butter. Now, this price increase is considered unfair by almost 80% of, of respondents. And the reason is that in this scenario, the uh, grocery store already had the peanut butter in stock. And uh, 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 so, so the, the grocery store did not incur a higher cost of procuring that peanut, that peanut butter. It would be, again, taking advantage of a situation uh, uh, by charging a, a higher price. And that makes this transaction be perceived, right? This is all uh, like descriptive. This is not normative, right? This is not saying that this is unethical or ethical. This is just a description of what people perceive as being unfair or, 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 or acceptable. The last scenario that I want to share from this uh, essay, now the grocery chain has stores in many communities. Most of them face competition from other groceries. In one community though, the chain has no competition. Although its costs and volume of sales are the same there as elsewhere, the chain set prices, sets prices that average 5% higher in other communities. Now, this is perceived as unfair by 76% of, again, the about 100 respondents and acceptable by only 24%. And the, the authors also presented similar scenarios with 10% higher prices and 15% higher prices. They obtained similar uh, reactions from people. Higher prices unaccept are unacceptable when the shortage is essentially, it's a, re, it's a result of monopoly power. So the shortage is uh, sort of artificial. It's the seller that created the shortage uh, by taking advantage in this case of, uh, of, monopoly, of monopoly power. So th the, all those different scenarios and the, the nuances sort of, you know, allow us to sort of, to, to draw some, us and, and the authors of the essay in particular, to draw some preliminary conclusions about what is acceptable, when it is, acceptable for firms to raise prices. And the following considerations can be, again, derived from, from those uh, vignettes and scenarios. It is acceptable, considered acceptable, to raise prices to maintain profit levels. So profits are not unacceptable. And most people believe that it's OK for sellers to maintain their usual, their normal profit levels, for example, when their input costs go up. It's also acceptable to maintain prices when costs go down. What is not acceptable is to exploit monopoly power. It's also not expect, acceptable to raise prices by exploiting shifts in demand, in particular when the shifts in demand uh, and the monopoly power are the result of natural disaster, uh, disasters and uh, emergencies. So it's not acceptable to take advantage of other people's misfortune and lack of alternatives uh, uh, at a time of, uh, of, of need. So, of course, uh, the anti-gouging laws, they uh, are motivated by this type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, attitudes and preferences, uh, strong preferences for fairness in, in, in uh, pricing. Uh, but firms also understand this on their own. And they often choose to not raise pricing, prices during, during emergencies. Uh, 
um, uh, they often choose to stick with pre-emergency prices. And I'm going to give some examples uh, 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 in, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Uh, again, people, customers don't like firms exploiting short-term monopoly power. Uh, they don't like, uh, customers don't like the idea that only rich people may obtain the goods uh, when prices dictate, uh, 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 or purchasing power rather dictates who can buy uh, things and who cannot buy things, because firms understand that people dislike uh, these uh, unfair uh, practices, uh, what practices that are perceived as, as being unfair, firms might be willing to forego uh, raising prices to avoid losing customers, to avoid creating, uh, uh, you know, again, the perception that they're exploiting people, and to avoid losing customers after the emergency is, uh, is over. Is over. This is a point that uh, uh, Richard Taylor uh, makes in a recent uh, New York Times uh, uh, op-ed. Uh, the title is uh, beautiful, The Law of Supply and Demand is Not Fair. Uh, the subtitle is also really interesting because it uh, introduces our next, uh, sort of the next part of my, of my talk, uh, sort of the other, uh, uh, so you know economists always like to uh, uh, to uh, structure their, uh, uh, and I'm an economist, to structure their, uh, their uh, uh, talks by, or arguments by saying, you know, on the one hand, uh, you've got this and that, and on the other hand, there's always another hand when, when an economist is talking. And in this case, there will be another, another hand. So the subtitle to this article says, in a crisis, consumers think it's outrageous to jack up, jack up prices of essential items, yet the very same social norm predictably leads to shortages. That's where, where I'm going, where I'm going uh, uh, next uh, with, my, with, my, with my talk. So if, if firms don't raise prices, okay, either because, um, they, because of the um, uh, anti-gouging laws, because they're worried that they might, that the raising prices might uh, trigger those uh, uh, reactions and, and the anti-pricing, anti-gouging uh, uh, laws might be invoked. Uh, but also, uh, you know, because customers dislike uh, those uh, price uh, uh, increases. So what happens then when prices do not increase? Well, the alternatives to, to price rising uh, are one form of an, or another uh, of rationing. For example, uh, several stores right now in, in the, in, in, during the COVID-19 epidemic, many stores have limited uh, the, uh, you know, individual purchases. Uh, uh, surgical masks, uh, hand sanitizer, but also things like pasta, uh, uh, water, uh, uh, toilet paper, uh, uh, paper towels, and so on. Many stores have limited uh, the amount that each individual customer may, may, may purchase, um, or uh, they might sell on a first come, uh, first serve uh, basis. Uh, 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 when prices are low, right, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and people are afraid that uh, there will be shortages in the future, what happens often is, that is, is hoarding. Uh, we've seen scenes uh, uh, such as the one uh, uh, represented in, in the picture on, on this slide uh, of people purchasing large quantities of certain items, including, including uh, toilet, uh, uh, toilet paper. Secondary markets, secondary markets might develop if I buy a lot of an item and, uh, uh, for cheap uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and the secondary market develops, I can then resell the item uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the secondary market. Um, so um, we have seen um, as a result, right, uh, of, uh, of uh, all of that, uh, uh, shortages to uh, develop, and these are all pictures from uh, uh, taken from uh, uh, news articles in the in the COVID nineteen uh, uh, in the COVID nineteen uh, uh, epidemic. Um, so um, when I as when I was preparing for for this talk, I came across uh, 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 an article uh, uh, that related that that reported about uh, a um, uh, a store in Washington D.C that uh, got sued, uh, it, it was uh, accused of selling uh, bleach. Uh, it was accused of price gouging, of selling bleach uh, uh, for nearly $13 when stores like uh, uh, Target sold the same bottle for just over $4. $4. So this was actually a, uh, on, on the news, uh, uh, there's a video at the link uh, 
Uh, and when you watch the video, when I was watching the video, I noticed something when the uh, video showed a, uh, uh, a snapshot from, uh, from the target website. Uh, and if you, if you zoom uh, on, on this, you see that, yes, uh, the Clorox was available uh, in principle uh, uh, on tar uh, uh, the website for uh, $4.29, but uh, due to high demand, the item may be unavailable or, uh, or, de or delayed. And there are many, many stories uh, uh, of uh, uh, items being unavailable, of shortages of uh, uh, a bunch of products uh, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic. Um, a, uh, a recent uh, uh, um, survey of, uh, of uh, uh, grocery stores around uh, uh, the US uh, 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 documented that uh, in many, in a large uh, uh, number of, uh, of stores, uh, uh, many items were uh, out of stock. Uh, toilet paper and disinfecting wipes, for example, were not available in about 90% of, uh, of, of stores. Um, shoppers, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do they do when they don't find uh, an item in their, uh, in their uh, favorite store? Well, uh, some of them may manage to buy it somewhere else, but about 50% or 55% of customers did not find what they were looking for uh, at, any, uh, at any store. So the, the idea that is that these shortages, remember this is important uh, to, to keep in mind, the shortages are not caused by high prices. Shortages are caused by high demand and scarcity, and high prices are typically a consequence of, of, of scarcity and not vice versa. Uh, these uh, other, the, the survey that I just mentioned um, uh, showed that there was uh, uh, some, uh, in some cases, significant uh, geographic variation in the extent to which certain items were uh, in short, in short uh, uh, supply. So the severity of the shortages varied across different areas uh, of, the United, uh, of the United States. And of course, um, we, what we want in an ideal world is we want uh, goods that are scarce, uh, uh, that are abundant or relatively abundant in one uh, area to flow uh, and to become available uh, in areas where there's more uh, scarcity of the, of the, of the good. Uh, the New York Times had a story a few weeks back uh, about, uh, a, uh, uh, about two brothers uh, who uh, in March uh, rented a U-Haul and they, do they drove 1,300 miles across Tennessee and Kentucky uh, hitting store after store and uh, filling their truck uh, with thousands of bottles of hand sanitizer and uh, uh, packs of, uh, of antibacterial wipes and so on. And then what they did was they, they uh, listed those items on, on Amazon. Uh, one of the brothers said that he posted 300 bottles of hand sanitizer and immediately sold them all for between $8 and $70 uh, uh, each. The next day, Amazon pulled the brothers' uh, items and thousands of other items from their uh, websites, suspending many accounts. So on the other hand, uh, Mr. Colby did not believe that that was price gouging. He, said, he, he essentially said, look, perhaps those uh, Purell bottles norm that normally retail, normally retail at $1 each, but he said that people forget that his price of $20 includes his labor, Amazon, uh, Amazon's fees and about $10 in shipping. Uh, so he, he said, just because it cost me $2 in the store, that doesn't mean that it's not going to cost me $16 to get it to your, uh, to your uh, door. Uh, so what he's saying is that, look, he's essentially claiming that he's doing essentially a public service, uh, purchasing uh, goods in areas where there's no scarcity or there's less scarcity and making them available to people who otherwise would not be able to, to find them. And that is uh, costly. Um, the uh, uh, idea that uh, procuring certain items during emergencies uh, uh, becomes more costly is, uh, is, uh, is a, a founded uh, idea. For some goods and services though, prices do not rise as much when demand uh, increases. This is the case of uh, Zoom, you know, video conferencing, a platform that we are using uh, right now. I used the Wayback Machine and checked their prices in March of 2019, and today their prices are, are identical. 
Um, although uh, uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom's stock price has increased quite a bit in the past few months, it went from $67 in, in January to, to uh, $210 uh, 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 today. What's the idea? Why didn't the uh, uh, Zoom have to raise their prices? Well, it's because the uh, uh, elasticity or the responsiveness of uh, uh, supply uh, for Zoom products uh, is, uh, is quite high. Uh, Zoom can serve additional customers uh, uh, at a lower additional cost compared to other services and, uh, and, uh, and other goods. And this idea of uh, that some goods uh, 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 need additional uh, uh, costs to, 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 to get produced in additional quantities when uh, uh, when demand surges is, is really, uh, really important. Um, so this is the case, for example, of uh, N95 respirators and surgical masks. In March of 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services stated that the US had a stockpile of 12 million N95 respirators and 30 million surgical masks. But they estimated that the US would need about 3.5 billion uh, uh, masks because of the COVID-19 epidemic. Now, increasing the supply of N95 and, and surgical masks in the short run is very costly. Uh, producers need to add shifts. They need to add production lines, procure materials, hire more personnel, or pay their current personnel more to induce them to work longer shifts. Um, it's more costly to procure certain uh, materials because of a disruption in global supply chains, increased risk. Many countries have blocked or stopped uh, uh, surgical masks from leaving the country uh, at, at, the, at the border uh, and so on. And maintaining inventories is also uh, costly. Uh, there's uncertainty about future needs. So why don't we have a, uh, a bigger stockpile of, uh, of many of these uh, uh, essential items? Because it's costly to, in part, is because it's costly to maintain large uh, uh, inventories. Um, and, uh, 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 and so see how you see how in this case, uh, producing more of a good is possible, but it's costly. And because it is costly, it is typically done only if the price is allowed to, uh, only if the price is allowed to, uh, to increase. Um, the, there's many ways in which uh, uh, public authorities uh, try to again intervene in this in this context. Uh, in Italy, uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm, uh, accent I'm originally from Italy. In Italy, the government introduced a, introduced a price cap on face masks, uh, on surgical masks in particular, at 50 cents uh, per mask. According to many accounts, the idea was to make those masks affordable. But according to many accounts, uh, Italy's plan uh, uh, flopped uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in, a, in an important way. Um, according to a survey of pharmacies, before the price cap was introduced, masks were available at 66% of pharmacies. After the price cap of 50 cents per mask uh, was introduced, masks were only available at 25% of, of pharmacies. And you would see signs like the one uh, that, I, that I put up on this slide. I'm translating it for you. This sign was put up on a pharmacy, on the, on a, on the, on the window of a pharmacy. And what the pharmacy says is that, look, as you can see from the invoice below, we paid the masks 90 cents of euro, of a euro for plus VAT. Uh, and they said they cannot ask us to sell them at 50 cents plus, uh, plus uh, VAT. This just doesn't make any, any economic sense. So this is one of those cases where, you know, good intentions to you know, introducing a price cap with the intention of making things more affordable results in the opposite uh, 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 end outcome of making the item even more scarce and less available than it was uh, in, the, in the first uh, uh, place. Uh, governments do other, uh, may do other, uh, other things one way to combine incentives and fairness is for the government to uh, purchase uh, uh, masks from producers at uh, competitive prices uh, and then distribute the masks to citizens according to need. 
In this way, you, you, this is something that the U.S. government has uh, has been uh, has been doing. They announced in March, and they've done it. They would buy 500 million N95 respirators, paying uh, the uh, suppliers a uh, competitive price, and then distributing those masks uh, to hospitals and so on according to according to uh, uh, to need. I don't want to pile on the um, uh, Italian government, but I'm going to share uh, really quickly uh, another sort of uh, uh, initiative of the Italian government. What they did was they told people, look, particularly firms, they told them, look, you go ahead, buy PPE for your workers, we're going to reimburse you. What they did was uh, they allocated 50 million euros to this program. Firms made their purchases of masks, gloves, and so on. And then they entered their application for reimbursement on May 11th. This was labeled as uh, click day. But then what happened was that uh, the resources, the funds uh, were exhausted uh, once 1.05 seconds after firms were allowed to enter their applications uh, online. There were more than 200,000 applications and only 3,150 firms were, were reimbursed. So these plans, they're well intentioned, but they don't always work uh, as, uh, as, uh, as planned. The COVID-19 epidemic pricing uh, is uh, uh, going to be, is, and it will be extremely important when it comes to drugs. For example, uh, you might have heard, you probably have heard about uh, remdesivir. Uh, this is a drug produced by Gilead that uh, uh, preliminary findings from a randomized control trial suggest that uh, it might actually help uh, to treat uh, uh, COVID-19, at least, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, some patients and uh, uh, in part. So the Institute for Clinical Economic Review, they uh, computed the dollar value of, uh, of the drug based on effectiveness. And if the mortality benefits are confirmed, uh, the drug would be cost, effect would be effect cost effective uh, at a very high price of $4,500. So the question is how much should Gilead charge for, for the drug? Right now, this was an already existing drug. Gilead has already uh, uh, 1.5 million doses of the drug. They've donated those doses to the US government for, uh, for allocation. But the question uh, of you know, how much Gilead should charge uh, uh, for, for uh, in the future is uh, extremely important. And here too, I'm gonna say, on the one hand, uh, and, and I'm, I'm linking here to a, uh, uh, an article that discusses these issues very nicely. On the one hand, the uh, pharmaceutical company will be watched very carefully uh, because of fairness uh, uh, considerations. Uh, their pricing policy will be watched very, very carefully. On the other hand, uh, uh, an economist from Northwestern noted that, well, we don't need, we don't think that this is the only drug that we need. Um, um, uh, the thing that would worry me the most is that we're somehow telling people, pharmaceutical companies, that if you take the risky bet to try and, and develop new drugs or better drugs for COVID-19, uh, and then you do it, then you're not gonna get paid. So there is a concern that destroying incentives might result in less uh, uh, innovation. Uh, mm, to uh, uh, summarize, I'm gonna uh, go back to that case when supply is fixed. So to summarize, you know, prices play an important role in markets in general. They still play an important role in uh, emergencies and also during pandemic. Summarizing, uh, price incentives stimulate additional production. With additional production, uh, uh, additional supply that might actually drive future prices down, uh, reducing shortages. Uh, they incentivize the reallocation of resources across space, making sure that goods are available where they are needed the most. They affect the, you know, the willingness to build the inventories, which might affect the preparedness uh, to future epidemics. Um, in, in, in other words, if I know that uh, I will be able to charge a higher price uh, for a certain product, uh, I'm going to have a, a higher incentive to maintain a large inventory uh, 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 in my warehouse in case of a future, uh, uh, of a future uh, emergency. 
price incentives may also help with uh, you know stimulating uh, uh, innovation more and better goods and better uh, drugs and so on so I'm approaching the end of my of my of my talk I want to go back to the uh, John Locke uh, uh, scenario remember the merchant sending the two ships one uh, to Dunkirk where there's a uh, shortage of, of corn, and there uh, uh, the, uh, the merchant would sell his corn uh, for 20 shillings a bushel. The other ship would, would, would be sent to Ostend, where the corn would sell for only five by shillings. And then uh, John Locke asked, is it uh, ethical uh, for the merchant to, send, to sell the same commodity uh, uh, at a higher price uh, uh, where there is a, a shortage. And this is how Locke answers the question. Um, I, Locke, answer no, it's not unethical because the merchant sells at the market rate at the place where he is, but sells there no dearer to Thomas than he would to Richard. So it's okay to sell at 20 shillings in Dunkirk uh, 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 provided that you're selling to everybody at the same price, at the market price, there and then. And if there he should sell for less uh, than his corn would yield, he would only throw his profit into other men's hands, who buying of him under the market rate would sell it again to others at the full rate it would yield. Here, what he's saying is, look, if, he if the merchant sells at less than 20 shillings, a secondary market will develop. Someone will buy the corn at say 15 or 10 shillings and resell it at the market at the market rate. So I'm not saying that I necessarily think that this is the ultimate answer to the question of you know whether uh, uh, this is this action is, is is ethical or morally justified. But I will notice that this is a very deep and sophisticated uh, kind of uh, of reasoning. Uh, for uh, from an economic point, uh, from an economic point of view, saying that the market price plays a special role, he specified one further detail, which is again extremely insightful. Um, two more details. One is the following: if there, uh, uh, as there can be no other measure set to a merchant's gain but the market price where he comes, uh, so if there were any other measure. For example, at five or ten percent as the utmost justifiable profit. So, if we put a limit to how to the price that the merchant can can charge, Locke says there would be no commerce in the world, and mankind would be deprived of the supply of foreign mutual conveniences of life. So, it's essentially saying that prices have an incentive role, and if we destroy the incentive. The merchant might actually not send his second ship to Dunkirk, and the people of Dunkirk would actually uh, face an even more severe uh, shortage. The final detail that Locke offers is the following Dunkirk is the market which the English merchant has carried his corn. And by reason of their necessity, it proves a good market. And there he may sell his corn as it will yield at the market rate for 20 shillings per bushel. But listen to what he says next. But if a Dunkirker should at the same time come to England to buy corn, not to sell to him at the market rate in England, but to make him, because of the necessity of his country, pay, say, 10 shillings per bushel when you, sh when you sold to others for five, that would be extortion. So he's saying that if somebody from Dunkirk comes to England, then you are morally, you the merchant are morally uh, uh, obligated to sell to them, to the person, at the same price, five shillings that you are charging every other English person in that market. Because you, you have to sell, your uh, moral obligation is to sell at the market rate of where you are selling. You cannot take advantage of your knowledge that the person from Dun is coming from Dunkirk where there is, uh, where there is a, a shortage. So it's a very, very I think, sophisticated and interesting uh, uh, definition of you know, what is the fair price or the just price that a merchant, can, a merchant can, can charge. Conclusion, fairness and ethical considerations must be balanced against incentive effects. 
In my view, the first step is being explicit about these trade-offs. Yes, we don't like a price gouging. We don't like the perception that uh, uh, some customers uh, might be taken advantage or exploited at the time of need. Uh, but blanket anti-gouging laws might create uncertainty and could result in exacerbated shortages. What I think is that we need more evidence on these issues, on whether and how people perceive and elaborate these delicate uh, uh, trade-offs. We also need to get a better sense of how polarized these attitudes are. Is there extreme polarization in the US right now about these issues, or is there some common ground where we can come together and reach a solution that balances the fairness considerations on the one hand and the incentive considerations on the, on the other hand. And this is a broader point and conclude here, markets require social support to operate uh, even beyond sort of, you know, the, 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 current, the current pandemic, if markets are perceived uh, as uh, creating persistent inequalities, for example, or as not being conducive to uh, uh, you know, the flourishing of, 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 of people, then the social support for market institutions is undermined and, uh, and uh, you know, we have a problem and uh, in that case, and, and that's why it's critical to think about these issues and to design market institutions uh, 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 appropriately. I'm going to be um, reading questions from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the chat. Uh, there's a question from, uh, um, can't, I can't, uh, sorry. The first question is right now on Amazon, a 50 ounces refill of soft soap is $19.99 plus $6.12 12 $6 shipping. Have algorithms been given a pass when it comes to price gouging? Uh, this is a, a great question. Uh, I learned to say, I don't know. Uh, uh, to answer, I don't know uh, uh, when I do not know the, uh, the answer. So I'm going to say I, uh, I'm not sure. What I suspect, based on the uh, public stance that, ha that Amazon has taken and eBay, uh, 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 based on the, uh, uh, their sort of public statements and even the New York Times article that I read earlier, they've been, they've been, they were being extremely careful about not allowing uh, uh, sellers to charge. Uh, uh, excessive uh, or unconscionably excessive, uh, uh, excessively high prices for their products. So I want to believe that uh, they um, they uh, they try to 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 be to be careful. Now uh, from from the from this question, I I gather that uh, yes, this 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 is a high this is a high price. So uh, so it could be that they uh, they might not have been careful uh, careful enough. Um, a second question that I'm reading uh, from the so, the, uh, so from the uh, from the chat, uh, and um, which I believe is uh, is from from Brandy, and the first question was from Lewis. Um, how do you determine the balance that should be struck between keeping prices sufficiently low to keep customers, but not too low to avoid hoarding, rationing, etc. This is a tough one, a tough question. Uh, I did give uh, 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 one example of how uh, one can, a, a, a public authority or a government can try to maintain a balance between uh, keeping incentives alive, uh, while at the same time ensuring that uh, essential items are affordable. And that was uh, what the uh, US government uh, uh, said they would do in, in, in March. They would uh, purchase uh, N95 respirators uh, from, from producers and, uh, and, and paying a competitive price uh, and even guaranteeing uh, that payments would be made uh, even in case the COVID-19 epidemic somehow uh, you know, dissipated and the, and the masks were no longer needed. We know that that didn't happen, so masks are needed. So that's one way, right? You buy from producers, you pay a price that keeps incentives alive, and you distribute according to need and not to, uh, and not to you know, per the ability, uh, the ability to pay. One difficulty that I see with this approach is that there's a, there's a large number of uh, items and what that one could define as, uh, uh, as, as, as essential. 
Uh, and I'm not sure that the majority of us in, in society would want the government to be uh, in the sort of, you know, in the business of procuring all of those uh, necessary uh, items and distribute them to the, uh, to the, uh, to the population. Uh, the third question, I believe, uh, uh, from uh, this third question. I'm sorry, I'm getting uh, um, there's some real some some technical uh, difficulties. I'm going to read the question. Do you feel that a type of social contract between buyers and sellers could prevent price gouging and or hoarding in place without legal uh, without legal uh, measures? A social contract uh, um, kind of exists, and uh, according to um, some behavioral economists and psychologists, uh, that is the reason why, uh, perhaps counterintuitive, because we, we tend to um, uh, see and pay close attention to cases where prices went up by a lot because those are the cases that we find outrageous, those are the cases that make the news. So we pay close attention to those, but uh, it, it appears to be the case that prices do not, uh, often do not go up uh, sufficiently uh, during, uh, during uh, emergencies. Uh, and the reason is that social, is a version or, or a type of social contract, uh, uh, implicit contract between uh, uh, um, um, Distributors, sellers, uh, grocery stores, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and customers, sort of a reciprocity type of deal, whereby look, you grocery store promise not to increase the prices too much during an emergency, and I customer promise to go back to buying things uh, from your store when the uh, when the emergency is over. Now, hoarding is is is, is I believe it's it's a Diff more difficult type of, of behavior to, to, uh, uh, to curb. Um, it is, uh, you know, caused by low prices. If prices were higher, people would buy, um, you know, less of, uh, of, uh, of an item. They, they will be more likely to think about, you know, more carefully about, you know, how much of, say, toilet paper or paper towels or water, or so on, that they actually that they actually uh, that they actually need. So there is a real uh, there is a real trade off there, and I'm honestly I mean I'm I don't feel like um, although I do see that that hoarding causes externalities, even negative externalities. It imposes it makes things more scarce than otherwise would be. It is also a natural response. There's uncertainty, you know, people fear that uh, that there might be shortages in the future that the lockdown might last for for a long time they have family they they, they want to ensure that their loved ones are are taken taken care of so it's a really difficult situation uh, in in my in my in my view and it's obviously a conversation that could take uh, uh, that could take us uh, uh, you know hours um, so another question from uh, from Akshay do you see a difference in price gouging between capitalist or socialist countries, or is this a standard global, uh, uh, global phenomenon? This question goes, again, a little bit beyond uh, my, my, uh, 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 the depth of, of, my, of my knowledge. My understanding of uh, uh, socialist countries is that just because prices in the uh, uh, formal uh, uh, market were fixed at a certain uh, level as established by, uh, by the, the state, robust secondary markets uh, uh, developed where uh, uh, a market price, uh, uh, an underground, uh, a uh, black market price would uh, would emerge based on uh, on demand and and supply. Also, anecdotal again accounts of the reality of uh, uh, socialist countries was that uh, um, people who had connections with uh, the political party in uh, in uh, in power would have a preferential treatment. 
and uh, uh, they would uh, uh, receive uh, more of uh, essential uh, and non-essential uh, goods in spite of uh, the fact that shortages existed again in, uh, in, uh, 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 in the stores. So in addition to secondary markets or black markets developing, even in those countries uh, uh, where you, do, you could see sort of the law of supply and demand still operating uh, in spite of uh, the formal rules, you also have uh, uh, unfair, you know, just because the legal price is set at a certain level that is perceived as fair, that doesn't mean that other types of unfair practices are not uh, uh, are not uh, uh, taking place. Uh, and I'm told that uh, uh, this is the time that uh, we have. Uh, I apologize for the uh, technical issues that we had. I, I um, hope that everyone is uh, uh, safe uh, and, uh, and, and healthy in these uh, uh, difficult times. Uh, um, and I, um, I wish everyone uh, the very best. I thank you for um, um, you know, joining uh, me and us, uh, uh, Hopkins at home uh, uh, today. I uh, my my hope is that uh, we will uh, do more of these Hopkins at home uh, um, even after the uh, uh, after the uh, uh, epidemic, and that perhaps uh, there will be opportunities to do similar uh, 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 lectures and and conversations in person uh, in the not too distant uh, future. In the meantime, uh, uh, all best wishes uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and goodbye.